Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Heidi Collins, and I'm going to be speaking today about nutritional approaches to treating GI concerns in persons with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest with any portion of this presentation. Gastrointestinal concerns in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome uh, are common, potentially disabling, well-documented in existing literature, and often underappreciated by clinicians. EDS affects gastrointestinal processes, including digestion, absorption, elimination, and gut-related immune function. Why do these happen? Um, first of all, abnormal connective tissue structure, growth, maintenance, or function can be affected in EDS, and this can lead to abnormal um, transit through the gut, the gut can be sluggish, painful, it can be inflamed, and it can be what we call leaky. This can lead to conditions including dysmotilities and functional gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, additionally, autonomic nervous system abnormalities, uh, we also hear them called dysautonomias, um, for example, POTS, which are common in EDS, can cause additional GI symptoms or complications. Um, I often describe this to my patients um, by saying that they may be stuck in fight or flight versus being in rest and digest, which means that their gastrointestinal tract is really not doing its job correctly. Um, another very important aspect of GI concerns in EDS is that dysbiosis, uh, the dysregulation of the balance of microbes in the gut or dysregulation of gut-related immune function can cause inflammation, food intolerances, allergies, local or systemic autoimmune conditions, and additional GI or systemic issues. Um, it goes both ways. Um, while EDS can significantly affect a person's ability to achieve a healthy nutritional status, a person's diet can significantly impact how they're affected by EDS or EDS-associated comorbidities. So, you know, nutritional deficiencies in EDS can happen uh, mainly uh, because of ultimately malabsorption. And malabsorption in EDS is multifactorial. It can be due to intrinsic connective tissue abnormalities or things like functional dis gastrointestinal disorders with associated vomiting, diarrhea, dysautonomia, inflammation in the setting of gut-related immune dysfunction or dysbiosis. And we often see nutritional deficiencies in persons with EDS and this is despite them taking in adequate dietary uh, sources of nutrients. Also, we can still see nutritional deficiencies even when people are diligently supplementing. So EDS is bad enough. Um, EDS-associated comorbidities make things even worse. And unhealthy dietary choices in combination with malabsorption and issues such as food allergies or intolerances can lead to a significant downhill spiral. Ultimately, the goal of a healthy nutritional status is to minimize the impact of EDS and any EDS-associated comorbidities a person might have. Um, first, uh, before you can address EDS with a nutritional approach, it's actually best to learn what you can about basic human nutrition. Um, before we apply any EDS-specific guidelines, we really need to know about nutrition or supplementation regarding what makes a diet healthy for humans in general. And I say this because if you understand human nutrition, you are taking informed control of your nutritional status and thereby improving your own health. I think it's important to realize that the ultimate goal, you know, why eat healthy? Uh, the ultimate goal of nutrition is because we have to provide our cells with structural materials for them to do their jobs and fuel so we don't run out of gas. Nutrition includes dietary intake. Um, that can be anything from food or drink, um, also including supplements. It also, uh, nutrition also depends on digestion and absorption. Um, it's important to realize that uh, what we eat is affected by how we prepare the foods. Um, the nutritional content of something that is raw, for example, 
may be higher or lower in its bioavailability than when foods are prepared in other ways. So learning about nutrition is complemented by learning about cooking. Um, it's also relevant to educate yourself regarding the differences between GMO and non-GMO foods, organic and non-organic foods, and to keep in mind um, ethically sourcing of foods. Um, first, uh, I would mention proteins. Uh, proteins serve as a source of fuel, but this is not their main job. Um, it's generally we use lipids and carbohydrates for fuel. Proteins are most important in that they provide amino acids for reassembling into other proteins. So the graphic there is the triple helix of collagen, which is a protein, and collagen is considered a structural molecule. Proteins also come in forms of transport molecules like hemoglobin in the blood, membrane proteins that allow ions to pass back and forth, such as in nerve transmission. Um, hormones can be proteins, uh, and a good example of a protein hormone is insulin, and proteins act as enzymes uh, to uh, help in chemical reactions that take place in the body. Nutritionally relevant amino acids are classified as essential, conditionally essential, or dispensable. Um, it's important to realize that we need the proteins for those amino acids. Our genetic code is a set of instructions for proteins. That's really all that genes do. They encode proteins. Every gene indicates an exact sequence of proteinogenic amino acids to be bound together to make a specific protein. Our cells are capable of making amino acids by combining simpler molecules, but our cells can only make certain amino acids and we have to get the rest from what we consume. So that's where we get this terminology that essential um, amino acids are the ones that our cells can't make and amino acids that can be made by our cells are considered dispensable in the diet. Um, certain stressors, physical stresses like health conditions, illnesses, including inherited conditions, um, and in times of those stresses, otherwise dispensable amino acids actually become um, essential through diet. So that's where we're calling them conditionally essential. Um, it's important to realize that protein requirements vary throughout a lifetime. For example, if you're young versus old, or if you're in a state of breakdown versus a state of growth. Next, um, I have a, a chart that's very useful as an example, illustrating the difference between complete and incomplete proteins. Um, think of complete proteins as animal-based and incomplete proteins as plant-based. Um, diets lacking variety run the risk of missing essential amino acids, especially if they're predominantly plant-based. That's because plant-based proteins are incomplete. Those who eat meat don't have to work so hard for the variety to get their essential amino acids because their food ultimately did that for them. Vegetarians and vegans have to eat combinations to get complete proteins. One exception is soy, and that's why soy has been so popular throughout um, the years. Um, it is the only known plant-based complete protein. But too much soy is not good. Um, it's not complete with respect to other nutrients other than amino acids. It's not going to give you a complete set of, for example, vitamins and minerals. Also, soy has problems because of its estrogenic effects. It's a, what's known as a phytoestrogen and can cause health problems. Um, it's important to realize here, um, vegetarians and vegans who are very carb heavy eaters really seriously can lack protein in their diet. So speaking of carbohydrates, um, we mentioned that proteins are generally used to contribute to structural molecules where carbohydrates serve as fuel fuel is broke, the carbohydrates are broken down into glucose, which is the main fuel for cells. And one exception is carbohydrates known as fibers. They're not easily broken down into glucose. But what do we do with the excess glucose, especially if we have a very heavy carb diet? Small amounts can be served, uh, stored as glycogen in the liver and in muscles, but the remainder is typically stored as fat. And I have a graphic here describing the glycemic index where you can see 
foods that are low in their glycemic index are considered healthy, good, and as we move toward the foods that are high in the glycemic index, they're indicated as red in the graphic, they are fairly unhealthy because they really load your blood with sugar not long after they are eaten. Um, it's important to realize that carbohydrates are usually used for short term, they're intended for short term energy storage, and they contain two times less energy for, per gram than lipids. Um, another way of thinking of carbohydrates is that carbohydrates are found primarily in plants. Note that dairy products also contain carbohydrates in the form of lactose. Um, this graphic uh, shows you some categorizations or classifications of carbohydrates. And if you note, um, we have on the left-hand column sugars. And in the subgroups, monosaccharides and disaccharides, they're sugars made up of only one or two of the basic sugar molecules. And there is a list all the way on the right of some examples. Sugar alcohols are called polyols, and we find them as naturally occurring, typically naturally occurring um, sugar alcohols that are used as sweeteners that are non-caloric. Um, the longer chain oligosaccharides, which is only three to nine um, small sugar molecules linked together, um, include fructooligosaccharides. Um, polysaccharides are the very long chains, and that's where we see our starches and non-starchy um, fibers. Um, one thing you might notice if, you're, if you look closely is the acronym FODMAP um, comes from this carbohydrate classification. FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Next, um, it's important to learn about lipids. Um, lipids uh, is often, that term is used often synonymously with fats, but it's not technically synonymous. Lipids include fats and oils, and fats are molecules that are solids at room temperature, and oils are lipid molecules that are liquid at room temperature. Lipids serve as fuels, and they, uh, like carbohydrates, are stores of energy. Um, they're normally used for long-term energy storage. They're stored as fat in adipose cells, and they contain two times more energy per gram than lipids. The thing is they're less soluble in water than the carbohydrates are, so they're harder to transport in your blood, and that's why they're typically stored as fat. Lipids include fatty acids and triglycerides, and fatty acids are referred uh, to as either essential or non-essential. So if we look at the graphics that I have on this slide, um, good fats include saturated fats, which is your examples of the meats and the butter and the cheese um, on the top left. Monounsaturated fats are increasingly healthy. The saturated fats, you're uh, supposed to get no more than 10% of your total caloric intake in any given day. And the monounsaturated fats um, should make up more of your lipid intake. Um, polyunsaturated fats are the best of all, and they include your omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. But at the bottom, I've shown a picture with trans fats. They are altered in their chemical bonding in a way that is ultimately um, unhealthy. Um, given the brief uh, length of this talk today, I don't really, I can't really get into explaining exactly why trans fats are bad, but I think um, people are, are pretty in tune with the idea that trans fats are the unhealthy fats. Um, I'd make a special mention as well here of a particular molecule. Uh, lecithins are mixtures of glycerophospholipids. So that's um, sort of a sugary fat in oils and they are used to smooth food textures, emulsify or dissolve powders, homogenize liquid mixtures or repel other materials. And an example would be in nonstick cooking spray. These are common in the Western diet and the modern food industry, and they're a very hot topic in nutrition. Uh, this graphic is uh, pretty busy, and I'm not intending for anybody to be able to read all the tiny print. The basic idea of this graphic is that on the left hand, we have the omega-3 fatty acid family, and on the right hand side, we have the omega-6 fatty acid family. 
And what you'll notice in the middle is there is listed an enzyme which will catalyze a step uh, in the breakdown of these fatty acids so that they can be used in nutritional metabolism. Um, what you'll notice is as you go through the steps of breakdown on the left hand side, the omega-3 fatty acids will generate a sort of light greenish box full of what they call eicosanoids um, about halfway through these steps. They are less inflammatory than the pinkish box of eicosanoids that are generated by the same enzyme steps when we're breaking down the omega-6 fatty acids. And the take home message in this slide is you can supplement as much as you want with omega-3 fatty acids and that's great. You're getting a less inflammatory breakdown product and they're an essential amino acid. Problem is, if you have too much in your diet of omega-6 fatty acids, though that uh, offset that you get from supplementing with omega-3 fatty acids is not going to completely undo the effect of those pro-inflammatory eicosanoids that are generated by the breakdown of omega-6 fatty acids. So that's, this is just sort of a factoid in nutritional education to explain that um, you can't fix everything by just popping a, a fish oil pill. It really, you have to be looking at your intake as a whole, and while you can supplement the omega-3s, you need to limit the omega-6s. Um, next is micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. Uh, vitamins are organic molecules and they're considered uh, essential in some cases because our bodies can't make them. So a good example is vitamin B12. Conditionally essential uh, vitamins include vitamin D. We are able to finish some of the steps in uh, formation of active uh, metabolites of vitamin D, but it all depends on the current state of health um, as to whether or not we can do that. Fat-soluble vitamins include A, D, E, and K versus the other vitamins which are water-soluble. And then there are vitamin-like nutrients that aren't considered um, absolutely mandatory, but are key players in nutrition. Minerals are essential. We cannot make minerals in our cells. All minerals that we need are considered essential minerals, and they originate in the earth and can be found on the periodic table bioavailability of these minerals um, in food and supplements uh, varies according to the molecules that they are bound to. And there's the concept of a recommended daily allowance versus a therapeutic upper limit. There's either enough of a mineral or too much of a mineral. And then there's complex interrelationships between vitamins and minerals. On the periodic table, if you look at this graphic, the minerals listed in purple are essential for humans they're still needed in very small quantities, but they are essential. And then the other uh, listed elements in green are suggested to be essential, probably in trace or micro trace quantities. The rest of them are considered non-essential for humans. It's important to ask ourselves, what is wrong with our diet? Um, most of us um, in the Western world are eating what we call the Western diet. In particular, um, it's a very heavily processed diet. Um, it's been altered from what our ancestors would have eaten um, in terms of its glycemic load, very heavy in sugars. Um, it's got a fatty acid composition that is higher in those omega-6s, lower in those omega-3s. Um, its macronutrient composition is tending heavily toward the carbohydrates and the unhealthy lipids and less from the complete proteins. Its micronutrient density is reduced. We are not getting enough of the vitamins and minerals that our ancestors would have been getting with their typical diet. And there are other issues including acid base, um, salt ratios, and fiber content. Um, the Western diet is typically not high enough in fiber um, to promote health. Um, who do we blame for this? Partially, uh, I, would, I would say it, the modern food industry has had a mantra of better living through chemistry. And um, in addition to utilizing uh, chemicals that are stabilizers, emulsifiers, um, preservatives, colorants, flavors, um, there's also a huge focus on just listing what the nutrient content is rather than focusing how the food affects nutrition as a whole. 
um, chemically processed foods are convenient. For example, they have a long shelf life, they're appealing to taste, but they're bad in many ways. So the advice that I give my patients who have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and especially those who have Ehlers-Danlos related comorbidities, is the way that you eat is intended to minimize um, the impact of some of the comorbidities that we have. Um, I give examples or give advice to say, um, we really need to avoid uh, hypotonic fluids. And when it comes to water, it's better to drink isotonic fluids. Um, it's very important um, for those with autonomic dysfunction to um, consider avoiding proteins that are high in catecholamine precursors. And one thing that comes to mind is the use of the artificial sweetener NutraSweet or phenylalanine, um, which is a byproduct of uh, aspartame, um, because phenylalanine and tyrosine affect dysautonomia in that they are catecholamine pre precursors. Um, carbohydrates, uh, it would be relevant to really limit your glycemic load so that you have a low glycemic index because widely fluctuating blood sugars really drive uh, dysautonomia, um, can trigger a stress response that can see some of our patients suffering from dysautonomia experiencing a very severe reactive hypoglycemia. Uh, we should limit bad fats because they contribute to insulin resistance, again, affecting that sugar balance. And then it's important to note that vi some vitamins are particularly relevant when it comes to autonomic function. Uh, we see POTS very frequently in people who are deficient in vitamin B12. Um, minerals. Um, it's important to liberalize salt for some folks who are suffering from autonomic dysfunction because some of these minerals are particularly relevant to autonomic function. For example, magnesium is an alpha adrenergic blocker. Um, it's also important for many people who have autonomic dysfunction to consider minimizing their histamine load because histamine can actually drive a, a hyperadrenergic um, dysautonomia. I advise people to eat the, in a way that minimizes their gut-related immune dysfunction. This is where food intolerances, food allergies, and re, uh, cell-mediated reactions such as um, eosinophilic esophagitis, mast cell disorders, or antigen-induced reactions such as FPIs um, can seriously affect a person's health or well-being. Um, it's important to explore cross-reactivity, and I give an example of latex cross-reactivity so that very often people who cannot tolerate latex often find that they react badly when they're eating foods including avocados, bananas, tomatoes, etc. Um, I find that people need to consider using a food journal because they need to learn to recognize reactivity to things in their diet. They are do better when they avoid notoriously inflammatory foods like wheat, eggs, non-cultured dairy, and corn. And a big goal is to help get get that bacterial or microbial balance in the gut normalized so that you're not seeing dysbiosis because that assists in regulation of that barrier function and that immune function. Any dysautonomia needs to be addressed um, in order to help with GI dysfunction. Um, I list uh, some ways here, inclusions and increases in the diet that can help with the microbial balance. Uh, prebiotics and probiotics are logical. Um, antioxidants and fiber help with the health of microbes, and a diet should be rich in fresh greens, vegetables, and at least some uh, healthy fruits, but not to excess because of the carbohydrate load in fruits. Ancient grains are better than current um, hybridized grains, and uh, a diet ideally has uh, some beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, nuts, or almonds as tolerated. Um, in some cases, patients might need broad spectrum antibiotics and multi-strain probiotics to address this microbial imbalance. Um, deficiencies need to be addressed. Deficiencies like vitamin D, or as we talked about earlier, the omega fatty acids, if a patient's known to be deficient. Exclusions, as mentioned earlier, you wanna limit refined carbohydrates, not an excess intake of sugar, we don't want sugar substitutes, whether they be um, natural or artificially created. Um, artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, stabilizers, emulsifiers, etc. Lots of advice um, regarding how to uh, help with that microbial balance. It's an ongoing hot topic in nutrition. 
Um, for some folks, it's their gut is so out of balance that we are starting to consider the use of fecal transplant to establish normal biosis. Um, you want to eat to support digestion, absorption, and metabolism as a whole. And one topic I keep hitting, regardless of which of the nutrient families that we're talking about, is um, keeping that normal biosis in the gut because the microbial balance is heavily um, involved with our digestion and absorption of nutrient classes such as carbohydrates, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. Um, people need to recognize the proteins which generate allergic reactions or are at the heart of food intolerances, things like gluten, casein, zein. Uh, some folks benefit from use of things like glutamine to help with gut integrity and diamine oxidase to address excesses of histamine. Um, adequate hydration status is necessary, and it's pretty individualized, um, but it's necessary for helping with numerous chemical reactions and physical processes. Supplementation is very often required. Um, my mantra is people need to get vitamins and minerals from food. Um, deficiencies are very often evident in people with EDS and some of the common ones I see include magnesium, B6, D, B12, and C. These deficiencies exacerbate symptoms with the secondary conditions arising from EDS and they can often be challenging to address. They may even require parenteral nutrition or sorry, parental repletion. Um, Taking a supplement or prescription in excess of what the recommended daily allowances are needs to be under the advice of a clinician and needs to be considered um, like a drug, essentially. And some supplements that we use um, in specific situations, such as quercetin used in mast cell issues, they're not really recognized as a nutrient essential for humans, so there is no clearly established recommended intake. It's hard to provide advice as to exactly how much to take. But persons need, taking supplements have to discuss them with their doctor and indicate them when a medical history is taken, whether the, the intake person asks you or not, because these clinicians need to take these interactions between supplements and drugs into account. Um, you have to consider specialized testing and um, individualized repletion that might include parental role repletion. That would be things like um, inf IV infusions, injections, etc. And a patient needs to know what to expect. If they get a nutritional repletion to address a deficiency, they may expect that they'll feel 100% better within a week, and that's just not likely to be the case. Um, I wanted to bring up a, a specific topic of restrictive diets. And here, as an example, vegetarian or vegan diets are often running a risk of being very low in vitamin B12 and in some of the essential fatty acids. Um, additionally, there's these complex interrelationships between some of the micronutrients. And we see that in heavily plant-based diets, there's less bioavailability of some of our commonly absorbed uh, elements. So here, for example, they're talking about iron, zinc, and copper. There are complex interrelationships that need to be uh, paid attention to for people who are eating this restrictive diet as a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, before I move on, ad additionally restrictive diets include things like orthorexia or actual formally diagnosed eating disorders. Um, obviously they need to be addressed in addition with um, any problems with the gut that are occurring related to EDS. Overall, um, nutritional needs are very highly individualized. It's a very tangled situation. For example, dysautonomia can aggravate GI dysfunction and immune dysfunction, and GI dysfunction can aggravate immune dysfunction and dysautonomia, and likewise, immune dysfunction can aggravate dysautonomia and GI distress. It's a very um, interwoven problem. And we also have to pay attention to things like allergies, food intolerances, um, gut dysmotility. People that tell me it doesn't matter what you tell me I should eat, I just can't. Um, this is where it gets very challenging and requires a multidisciplinary approach. It's more than just what the person can go buy and eat from the grocery store. A basic approach is just eat food, eat food, not too much food, and mainly plants. Um, 
I particularly like these uh, books written by Michael Pollan. They're um, very, very easily read and approachable even by a younger audience, helping to explain a focus on eating food rather than this focus on the uh, modern sort of better living through chemistry nutrient-based diet. This is a graphic uh, screen grab of the actual four page document that I give when I'm reviewing with my patient, my new patients newly diagnosed with EDS, um, specific advice relevant to um, dietary guidelines and supplement guidelines for persons with EDS. And um, I will show you before the end of this talk where you can grab a copy of this document. So you're not really meant to be able to see the print on this page. Um, here are two very helpful smartphone apps. Um, I think it's important for people to find and use resources to become familiar with nutritional content of foods. Um, not all foods have labels and this app, the Natural Food Guide, will help you to understand what kind of nutrient value there is in um, pure foods, things like fruits, vegetables, meats, things that don't come with a label on them. Um, additionally, you have to figure out what foods you cannot tolerate. So even foods perceived as universally healthy can be problem foods for any given individual. Just because a food is considered to be nutritionally dense or healthy, it doesn't mean you should include it in your diet. What if it consistently causes problems with your GI tract or even beyond the G GI tract? Um, clinicians are specifically identifying allergies and gut-related immune dysfunction as medical issues, but the people themselves need to be able to identify their specific food intolerances. And this can be tricky, especially if much of your diet is processed food, because the intolerance can be for a singular ingredient or additive and not for the food as a whole. This may involve food diaries or food journaling. And then um, this food intolerances app is something that I find helpful because if a person suspects that they're intolerant of a specific um, item or an ingredient or portion of food, um, they can use this food intolerances to find out what foods contain that component. For example, um, salicylates or histamine or nickel is, is something that this app explores for people to show them what they may or may not tolerate. Um, similarly, if people are intolerant of food ingredients or chemical additives for their food, um, they can be just as intolerant of those additives in their medications or their supplements, and they may need to consider specific allergen-free supplements or supplements free from ingredients they can't tolerate. So when nutritional approaches are not enough, um, we need to get clinicians involved. If you eat a complete nutritionally balanced diet, but you still have nutritional deficiencies, or you just can't eat, for example, nausea or gastroparesis, I find a lot of my patients are saying, keep them from eating at all. In these situations, you, you cannot address these concerns simply through nutrition, and you have to have clinical management according to established and up-to-date standards of care. And these interventions can include, and they're not limited to cognitive behavioral therapy, swallowing therapy, uh, which helps with uh, aversions to textures or with dysphagia itself. Um, there can be prescription medications, enteral or parenteral nutrition or supplementation. This includes feeding tubes, intravenous infusions, intramuscular injections, and total parenteral nutrition or TPN. And there can be interventional procedures, implanted devices, or surgeries that are necessary. So nutrition is part, sometimes we need clinical help. Um, lastly, you are not not what you eat. More accurately, you're unique, you're complex, and you're a combination of factors, including what you eat and what your food eats. Um, it can include even what your ancestors ate and how that affects, affects your development and health. What your gut biome can help you to digest and absorb, and what your metabolism, which is influenced by both nature and nurture, can utilize, minus the waste and toxins that you can successfully eliminate. At this point, um, there's not a lot of published uh, review articles regarding clear universal advice uh, for nutritional approaches um, for problems in EDS, and I would argue that research regarding these areas is desperately needed. On this slide, I'm giving you a URL. Um, I'm hoping you can see it's tinyurl.com slash HACMDEDS. That is my Google Drive, 
any talk I've ever given, any resource that I have is freely available and encouraged for download. You can read the PowerPoint presentations best when they're downloaded and played on PowerPoint. And there's a few Microsoft Word files as well. But again, I encourage you to look them over, um, share them. Um, I, I intend to, I think knowledge is power. So I'd like to share uh, anything I've ever written about nutrition and diet and aspects of EDS. And that concludes my discussion about nutritional approaches to GI concerns in EDS.